Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining. My name is Ophelia Miolawi, um, the founder of STEM Girls Initiative. And this morning, we have with me Adelike Aditayo. She'll be taking us through some soft skills, the hard skills of the 21st century. Actually, if I have to tell you the truth, I've been through this slide and I can tell you how loaded it is. I feel like she was actually speaking to me when I was reading through the slide. So you're welcome. Just feel free to like, please feel free to express yourself, like make use of the chat room to ask questions. Any questions you have, please, your opinion, your suggestions, make use of the chat room. And right now, as we're about to start, we would like you, like, like I already told you, my name is Ophelia Miolai. Um, Actually, my location is USA, and I'm a data scientist professional. So you two, we also want to know you. Tell us your name, your location, and what you're doing right now in the chat room. And I'll be there monitoring your questions, your opinion, and everything you have to do. And this session is brought to you by STEM Girls Initiative. We mentor STEM girls, female in particular. I'll speak more about that towards the end of the section. But right now, I'm going to give it over to Tyre so she can deep dive in. Over to you, Dio. I'm oh, sorry, I did Dio. All right. Thank you so much to everyone for taking the time to join this webinar. And thank you to the founder of STEM Girls Initiative. As I said, my name is Tayo, and I'll be taking you through the soft skills, which I believe is the, one of the hard skills of the 21st century. To get started, um, I would appreciate if we can turn on our videos, please. If you could do that, that would be so appreciated. I guess it just makes it, makes it easier for me. I know I'm not talking to the screen. And also, I would appreciate if you go on mute, should in case you have something to say, you can use the chat section. It just helps us to have a better webinar and also to avoid distractions. Okay, to get started, I'll just talk a little bit about myself. My name is Tayo Adeleke, and um, I'm a graduate of food science and technology from the University of Ibadan, Nigeria. And also I'm a graduate of bachelor of science um, human resource management through the Dillian School of Business from the University of Lethbridge. I get this question a lot. Why HR from technology, which is science, to human resources? Well, I, made, I decided to, um, to go for a career transition after a series of several um, self-awareness. Like after my bachelor's degree in, H, in food technology, I realized that that might actually not be my strength. Like, um, like I said, it was just a series of several self-awareness um, evaluation. I was able to understand myself better. I was able to know what exactly I want for myself. And that decision actually paid off because that's why I'm actually doing HR right now. And also, currently, I'm HR administrator for Walmart Canada. Um, just to talk a little bit about Walmart Canada. Walmart Canada is a retail store, and they had headquarters in the U.S. Also... A volunteer with UNICEF Canada. My hobbies, I love reading books. I understand this is a new hobby though, but it's, it's my best, it's the best thing that happened to me. I love, I love reading books. I love to work out and I love to network. So agenda for today is that the first thing we'll do is to talk about the things you'll be taking away from this webinar. Afterwards, we'll talk about self-awareness and then we'll dive into soft skills and hard skills. We'll get to understand what exactly are soft skills, what are hard skills. And next steps will be after you're getting all the information from the soft skills, what next, like what are you doing with those information? And we'll wrap it up with questions and feedback in the chat section. Okay, so now let's talk about what you're taking away from this webinar. The first thing is to know that everything begins with self-awareness. I'm not sure if you were listening, but when I talked about my career transition from um, food science to HR, the first thing that I did was to evaluate myself. What exactly am I good at? Who am I? What do I love to do? What are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? And I strongly believe that whatever you want to do in life, you have to know yourself because as they always say, it's just you, your type in the world. Even twins don't have the same personality. Twins don't have the same temperament. So you just have to know that everything you want to do in your life, regardless of, even if you want to pick up a new job, begins with self-awareness. And afterward, I, I hope you take away that the importance of soft skills. Also, we'll talk, I hope you take away practical soft skill techniques and um, soft skills resources. 
Now let's get started. Does it sound familiar to be a certified network engineer? I mean, like you're an engineer, you've gone to school to get a to get a bachelor of engineering or whatever. You know your stuff. Like you have a very good GPA. You know how to handle a lot of things, but you have a problem meeting critical deadlines. I mean, like if a project is supposed to be due in March, but close to March, you still find yourself trying to um, get some things together. Probably you lack some prioritization skills or you just lack some skills. Also, does it, does it sound familiar to be good on when it comes to bringing clients in? Let's say you work in a field whereby um, you go out there to bring people. You have the, you have the personality to bring people into it, into um, a field, but when it comes to keeping them, having that good relationship with them, there is a problem. Also, does it sound familiar to doing a job interview? I mean, you know everything you want to talk about. You've crammed. You've talked. To, you know a lot about the company already. You know a lot about your job, but all the things you want to say, they're just behind your tongue. You just can't say them up because you don't have the confidence. And also, do you experience difficulty coping with life transitions? I mean, um, majority of people on this call, I assume, you're either done with NYSE or you're almost done with your bachelor's degree or whatever. Like, after that, what next? Do you, are you experiencing difficulty coping with that kind of, those kind of life transitions? And also, do you have a fear of failure? Like, say for example, you end up graduating from whatever degree you're doing and your grades didn't come out nice. What next? Do you, are, you, are, you, are, you, are you afraid of the failure? All these things basically is for you to understand that if you fall into any of these categories or something, it basically means that there is a gap in your soft skills. And I believe that this webinar would actually help you to fill the gap and especially with the resources you'll be taking away. Okay, did you know that 75% of long-term success, I mean, when it comes to long-term success, I mean that job satisfaction, career growth, everything depends on people skills, which are also called soft skills, while 25% depends on technical skills. And technical, technical skills basically is whatever you go to school for, like your certificates, whatever you're holding on to. Imagine if 75% of your success and career, I mean, everybody wants to grow in the career. Everybody wants to be, I'm the head of this, I'm the manager, I'm whatever. But 75% of that, of the success, depends on people skills and soft skills. And 25% depends on technical skills. The question is, how come school doesn't teach us what depends on what actually depends on, what our growth depends on. School gives us 100% technical knowledge, which is fine. I mean, like, there's nothing we can do about that, but it now depends on you as the graduate. How are you going to help yourself? If you know that 75% of your success depends on things that you don't get from school, so what next? According to author of Hiring for Attitude, Mark Murphy found that 46% of new hires fail in the first 18 months. Ultimately, 89% of the new hires fail for reasons when it associated with, associated with its attitude. I'll talk about this a little bit. I graduated last year and honestly, I would say my grades were, it might not be the best, like best graduation student, whatever, but I would say at least I'm above average. When I was done with school, I was very, I was very opportune to get a job right away. And reality dawned on me the first day we had a meeting, like, oh, now it's time, there's a round table, now it's time for me to talk. I was fidgeting, I didn't know what to say. And it's not like my brain is, is blank, like there's nothing upstairs. There is something, but I just didn't have the confidence to talk. I knew for sure that my communication skills is, is poor. The confidence wasn't there. When it comes to meeting etiquette, I didn't have it. Like, fine, you might think you have some things, but when you realize that, what you get out there is not the same as what you think you have. Also, I realized that if I actually want to grow in my field, I need to do a lot of upgrade when it comes to my, my people skills. That actually helped me a lot because I decided to join Toastmasters. I decided to um, upgrade my, my communication skills and so much more. Deep down in, in this webinar, we'll get to talk about a lot of that. But now my question is, why are soft skills neglected? If, all, if, num if numbers and research is telling us that 89% of new hires feel when it comes to attitude. So 
why don't they teach us soft skills in school? So now let's talk about soft skills and hard skills. What are soft skills? Soft skills basically are traits that make you a good employee, such as etiquette. And again, soft skill, I would say, makes you a great fit anywhere. It's not just the job. Trust me, if you get a job and say, for example, you get fired because of your attitude, if you pick another job, that same attitude is going with you. You're not leaving it behind. So basically, soft skill is it's a proof that you'll be great. You'll be a great fit anywhere. Keyword here is anywhere because, like I said earlier, should in case you even go to a supermarket to go shop, you can. Everyone can tell what you, what your soft skills are. If you if you are the type that you yell at people when you when a cashier is slow, we can they can tell. It's it it's something that it follows you everywhere. And there's something my mom says that your character is is like a um, smoke. It follows you everywhere. People can perceive it. It's a perfume. And talking about hard skill, hard skill are teachable skills or skill set that are easily measurable. Keyword here is measurable. If you have, let's say, 10 certifications in engineering or data analysis, we can measure that, right? We can count like number of um, PMP certification, PNG, MSc, and whatever. You can count all those things. And essentially, hard skills show you are a good fit for the job. Now, let's take a look at this. If soft skills should prove that you are a great fit and hard skill is saying you are a good fit, which is more important? It's the one that shows you're a great fit anywhere because if you have all the hard skills, you have all the papers, like certifications, and you cannot, you, can, you can't make use of them, you can't communicate them, then there's a problem. You can be a great fit, but personality is going to be, it's, it's going to ruin your, your certification or whatever you have as a hard skill. Robert Kiyosaki actually defined hard skill in a way that when I read Rich Dad Poor Dad, actually, I really love this um, quote from Robert Kiyosaki. It says, in the real world outside of academics, something more than just grades is required. I have heard it called guts, audacity, bravado, daring, tenacity, and brilliance. This factor, whatever it is labeled, ultimately decides one's future much more than school grades. Like I said earlier, it's a lot easier for you to say you have X number of certification. It's the, your job is to communicate whatever you have. Your job is to, is to be able to use your, the certifications to help you grow in your career. And beginning of this webinar, I talked about how 75% of your career success is it, 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 uh, dependent on your soft skill. And for Robert Kiyosaki to say that ultimately, all these things, which is audacity, tenacity, brilliance, um, bravado, daring, they determine your future. I've never, I've never um, registered for a class that my, the course will be titled tenacity or resilience. No. Fine, school teaches us to be very independent when it comes to soft skills, but they don't go deep, they don't go um, really deep to make us understand the importance of soft skills. A lot of new hires graduate and, like I said earlier, reality dawns on them when they get into the real world and they realize that, okay, now I have the, my certificate. What next? What do I do with them? And soft skill is the ability, ability for you to work in a team, to communicate effectively and to cope with conflict and, and pressure. If you work in North America, what's that? Sorry. If you work in North America, for an example, there are some things that are cultural when it comes to our background that you just can bring into the work the um, working environment. Example, we talk loudly, which is normal. That is how we are. We are loud when it, when it comes to communicating. But someone from North America would see that as being aggressive. Like, why is she raising her voice? Why is she talking this way? And also, there are a lot of cultural differences that if you, again, like I said, if you're coming from our culture, our background, which some things are really acceptable, and you're coming into this Western world, you have to you just have to understand and learn the soft skills. Communication is key when it comes to, when it comes to soft skills, when it comes to soft skills in North America, you just have to understand the importance of communication and conflict. Oh my goodness. Well, Deep down, um, this webinar will talk about communication and, and conflict. 
basically soft skill is a glue between all your technical skills. If you have, um, let's say you're an engineer, you have, like I said earlier, you have PMP, you have um, PNG, you have MSc, you have whatever, MBA, what glues all technical skills together is soft skill. So that is why I strongly, sorry, I can't hear myself. Can we go on mute, please? You're good. Okay, thank you. I strongly believe that 75, 75% of your long-term, um, or let me say 75% of your career success depends on soft skills because soft skill is a glue between all your technical skills. You can have a PhD and you're not great when it comes to soft skills. I'm very firm here and serious. There's no how you can go with that because if you don't publish your soft skills, the PhD is more like useless. Like I said earlier, I believe everything starts with self-awareness. If you don't know yourself, there's no how you can go. There's no how you can be true to yourself. Speaking of my example earlier, my, um, my personal example of me graduating and after graduating, I got a job and I realized that there's a lot to do. There's a lot of things that I have to learn. I was very true to myself to know that my communication skill is not the greatest. My public speaking skills wasn't good. Email and phone call etiquette was not at its best and a lot more. Like I said, everything begins with self-awareness. If you are not true to yourself, if you don't know yourself to know what, you, what, you, what are your areas of opportunities, what are your areas of strength, it would be very hard for you to actually do anything successfully. Now let's talk about self-awareness. Self-awareness refers to the capacity of becoming the subject of one's own attention. Keywords here are uh, um, subject and attention. Object rather and attention. You have to be very objective. You have to be, be like, this is me. I am the center of my attention. I have to focus on myself. It's very okay to get a lot of opinion from others. But if you don't know yourself, like, this is one thing I, I will say over and over again. If you don't know yourself, if you do not, if, and if you're not true to yourself, there is no how, even if like everybody should tell you this is what you should do. If you don't know yourself, all the opinion and advices, they are more, they are more or less useless because it won't work. I love this quote here from Daniel, which says, being self-aware is not the absence of mistakes, but the ability to learn and correct them. To talk about the top soft skills, communication here, which is more of like active listening, emotional intelligence, conflict, res conflict resolution, growth mindset, openness to feedback, which I believe is very key, adaptability and resilience and work ethic. To start up with communication. Communication can be defined in a million and one ways. And I believe that communication is just give and receive information. If I want to define to a layman, that is how I would define communication, is to give and to receive information. But again, there's, there are a lot of researches on communication, but I believe like if you can practice active listening, your communication skills will be the greatest. If not, well, yeah, the, the best actually. When it comes to active listening, it involves you paying close attention to what the other person is saying. A lot of communication, or let me say active listening can be cultural because like, there are so many things I had to change when I came to Canada as well. The way we brought up to communicate is a lot different from the Western world. Well, I will personalize this. I didn't be, I do not used to listen. Once somebody's talking, I'm talking back. It's nice to actually actively listen to what the person is saying. Pay close attention to what this person is trying to tell you. Imagine if someone is trying to explain something to you and you're cutting this person off. There's no way the person will be able to talk to you. And like I said, to define To define communication is to give and receive information. If you don't give the person room to give the information, there's not how you receive it, and there's not how you will get better with whatever they're trying to tell you. So communication skill here is 
basically active listening. You have to be active when it comes to listening. You have to pay attention. And active listening helps you understand what the person is trying to say. And it helps you to respond appropriately. Active listening is to clarify a lot of information. Just like, so you, what you are saying is, just to clarify, are you asking me to do this? And trust me, there will be a lot of active listening when you start working because so many times your manager or supervisor or whatever will tell you to do things. And if you don't listen to them, you do it where you think you understand it. It's a failure because they believe that, okay, are you a baby? Am I supposed to be babysitting you? But if you clarify, okay, um, just to clarify, do you mean I should do this? Or so what you are saying is, I should do this. It just helps you to make the person, who is the person giving you the information to know that you are actually listening. And it's given the person a lot of confidence in you already that you will know what you are going to do. And you as a person receiving the message, it helps you to understand that, it helps you to understand what the person is trying to say. And also it helps you to do your job appropriately because you've clarified, like, you know that, okay, I understand what this person is trying to say. In essence, communication is active listening. You just have to be active when it comes to listening. And mind you, listening is not active listening. I'm not sure if I mentioned this earlier. You can be listening to someone and you don't even know what this person is talking about. But active listening is you clarifying. It's you understanding what the person is trying to say. It's you paying close attention to what this person is trying to say. And essentially, active listening helps with problem solving. Like I said earlier, if you know what you're doing, it's easier for you to solve a problem. It's easier for you to jump on a project if you know what exactly you're doing. And you can only know if you clarify, if you know exactly, you understand what you're supposed to do. If you want to work on your problem solving skills, I would recommend you work on your active listening skills. As long as you can listen appropriately to what someone is trying to tell you, a lot of things will be solved. Now let's talk about emotional intelligence. I strongly believe emotional intelligence is the fastest growing skill. And again, I know you will hear this a lot. A lot of things are cultural. The way we handle things culturally is, sorry, I don't know what this line is here. Okay, can you guys see the red line here? Hello? Okay. Uh, I'll just go forward. Emotional intelligence, like I said, it's the fastest growing skill. Like, hardly can you have a good communication, hardly can you be a good leader without emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence basically is you understanding every, your environment and the emotions around you. Looking at this picture, you can see someone crying, you can see someone laughing, you can see a grin. You can see laughter, you can see laughter, you can see someone being surprised. Basically, emotional intelligence is just you recognizing other people's emotions. It's you knowing when somebody is actually laughing. It's you when you know when somebody is crying and recognizing that emotions. And mind you, the fact that you 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 recognize this emotion doesn't mean they are they are very feasible. Sometimes people hide their emotions. But if you are high in emotional intelligence, you would be able to tell if something is going wrong. You would be able to tell if this person is actually in a good mood. And if you, are, if you are high in emotional intelligence, you would be able to handle pressure in a healthy way. And I say this because life itself is full of pressure. Like in a work environment, you can have like, let's say, a lot of projects, X number of projects to work on. and a lot of people will say, I'm stressed. They will be cranky. If you ask them for example, a pen, they will just start being aggressive. It's just because they cannot recognize their emotions. Right. And if you recognize your emotions, you are, you are mindful of other people's emotions as well. Emotional intelligence, in, in, someone that is high in emotional intelligence would be able to be mindful of someone else's emotions. Say for example, there's a lot of things I have to work on, like a lot of projects and deadlines is actually coming. If I'm high in emotional intelligence, my coworker doesn't have to know that I'm cranky or whatever, or 
I can't handle this pressure, right? And again, so like I said, a lot of things are cultural. Like the way we, we I would say Nigerians naturally, the way we handle things, like everybody must know when we are tensed, everybody must know that we are cranky, everybody must know that we are busy. But essentially, like, that is not the way forward. If you want to be a leader, if you want to grow in your, in your, in your career, in life or whatever, you have to be able to handle pressure in a healthy way. And also, if you will be able to understand and cooperate with others, OMG, it's very hard to work with people. I'm not going to lie. It is not easy. Like, because you're working with someone, they have different personalities, they are different temperament. They are, they are not you. What is working with you might not work with them. It's so hard to deal with people. I have no doubt about that. But if you're high in emotional intelligence, you will be able to understand individual differences. You'll be able to tell like, okay, maybe this is how this person is. Let me just accept this person for who she is. Or you, maybe you just avoid this person when it comes to a certain project. Or maybe um, there's a project that work and there's the person that doesn't like to, like doesn't like to um, stick with time. You know that, okay, I need to understand this person. This person lacks time management. That is you being aware of the person. That is you high in emotional intelligence. You, you understand that this person is, is not at the greatest when it comes to time management. Then you know that, okay, what I have to do is I have to make, probably give this person the project earlier before others. It's just based... Emotional intelligence helps you to understand and cooperate with others. It helps you to be a good team player. And emotional intelligence helps to be a good listener. Because if you are aware of people's emotions, you are aware of your own emotions as well. When someone is talking to you, it helps you to know, okay, I think this person is being a, is, um, raising his or her voice. Let me calm down. Okay, I think this person is very passionate about what this person is talking about. Don't let me call this person short. Let me let, let me let this person talk. Let me listen. It helps you to be a very good listener. And also it helps to be empathetic. When you, for example, I have a co-worker that anytime we, um, she gets to work, she gives me a download of her dog. His name is Dennis. She tells me everything about Dennis. Dennis is amazing. Dennis did this, Dennis did that. But I, I, imagine if I'm getting to work and I see that, Nothing about Dennis today. If I'm high in emotional intelligence, I should go ask her, hey, how is Dennis? No Dennis gist. Like, do you get what I mean? It's just for you to be aware of this person, just to be empathetic. And she can tell me, oh, yeah, uh, maybe I'll talk to you about this later. In me, that basically means that there's something wrong with her. But you know what some people would do? They want to give her the space. That is the time they will start talking about it again. If you are high in emotional intelligence, you will be very empathetic. You understand that, okay, maybe now is not the time to talk about this. You will be able to bring things up at the right time. When it comes to communication as well, timing is everything. Sometimes it's, you don't want to talk about some things. And sometimes you're like, okay, let's talk about this. If you have been empathetic, you will be able to tell when something is not going right. And should in case you see your coworker not at the greatest mood, even if he's not the person on a normal day, is bipolar when it comes to emotions. But if you're empathetic, you can tell when this person is at the greatest or when this person is not happy. Say, for example, you can say, okay, um, do you mind if we go for coffee together? It might just be 10 minutes walk, but guess what? You make the person feel a lot better than how the person came to work. Life happens. It might be relationship. It might be family. It might be work pressure or whatever. But you've been empathetic means that you are very high in emotional intelligence. The last one here is open to feedback. Emotional intelligence helps you a lot when it comes to feedback. Because if you can, let's think about, let's talk about this again. If you are a good listener and you handle pressure well, you understand that cooperate with others, you are empathetic. There is a high chance that you would, you would accept feedback in a good way. And basic, what's feedback? Feedback is just you getting information about whatever you do. Information means that, okay, um, let me just say reviews, actually. It's just getting a review of whatever you do. If you are a cook, like that is what you do as for your profession. If you receive feedback, 
on maybe whatever you cook. It might be the greatest of what you did. You can be telling everybody like, oh my goodness, I killed this meal. It's the best. I did all my... But if you receive the feedback and you're high in emotional intelligence, you should be able to A, listen, B, cooperate, C, you have to handle it in a very good way. So this slide basically is just talking about the importance of emotional intelligence. You have to be able to handle pressure well. You have to understand and cooperate with others. Like no man is an island. No matter how much you want to be a one-man island, I don't want to deal with people. Because I get that a lot. Some people would say, um, I want a profession that I don't have to deal with people. I want a profession that I don't want to talk to anybody. But no matter how, you will still deal with people. You will still talk to people. So emotional intelligence helps you to be a good listener, empathetic, and open to feedback. Sorry, I'm just gonna go to feedback. Okay, speaking of feedback, feedback is a two-way. Feedback is, I would say, is a sister to communication skills. As communication skills is something that is not everybody that has it like at the best. Same thing with feedback. A lot of people don't know how to give feedback. At the same time, a lot of people don't know how to receive feedback. And it's okay if that is how it is. Like, as long as you are, as long as you are self-aware and you want to do something about it, everybody, I mean, everybody can change when it comes to things like giving feedback. Um, if you are the feedback giver, like you are the one giving the review, please, please, and please, use the sandwich style, which is positive, negative, and positive. Like I said earlier, a lot of things are cultural. The way I grew up is when they give you feedback, they just all the negative, and that kills your self-esteem. It kills, it kills you in, inside, it kills the person inside of you. But imagine you starting with the positive, let the person know what the person did right. First, then first, it changes the game. Like, even when it comes to kids, they tell you when you want to train your kids, let them know what they did right first before you can tell them what they need to do better. I know a lot of people say, okay, this is how you do the, the Western world kids or whatever, but it just changes the game. It changes everything. Starts with the positive. Say, for example, um, you asked me to, make a, uh, to sell this phone, for example. You gave me two weeks to sell this phone, and... Within two weeks, I'm still unable to sell this phone. If you want to give me feedback, you should start by saying, I understand you'll be putting in some work into this. Good job with that. Even though you know the person is not putting in the work, start with the positive. Start by saying something nice that, that can build the person up. Then go to the negative by saying, if you're putting more work into this, let's say you devote two hours a day to sell this phone there's a good chance that you'll be able to sell this phone. Or um, maybe you just have to nail, nail it on the head saying, you might not be doing your best, when you, you, might, you might not be putting in your best with selling this phone, but you've already recognized the person's effort by saying the positive first. Positive, negative, positive. That is how to give feedback. If you're a feedback giver, and I'm just going to emphasize on this because a lot of these are, are very cultural. The way we give feedback back home is just very terrible. Like you just kill the person, kill the person's efforts. No, please don't do that again. Make sure you start with something positive. Even if there's nothing about the, about the um, project or whatever you're giving feedback on, make sure it's, maybe you um, compliment them at first. Tell them they look good. It doesn't have to be on the project. If you don't have anything nice to say about the work, Tell them they look good. And you cannot say, oh, just to give feedback regarding this, I believe you should do this. And close with a positive. Closing with a positive helps the person to feel better after the negative. And I say this because if you tell somebody, some, for example, let's go back to the cooking. This person puts in several hours to cook and you just come say, oh, this food is very salty. Why did you cook this way? It just it's just very bad in the sense that, one, you do not even recognize the number of hours this person put in to put everything together. B, fine, the food is salty, but do you know how bad that person will feel? You just say, um, I understand you're putting a lot of hours into this. The food is salty, and you just leave. 
But if you close it with the feedback by saying, well, the rice that was actually a lot better. Thank you. The person is, honestly, this person you're telling this doesn't mean that because you said the rice was better and the person will ignore the salty food. No. It just makes the person a lot better. Like, okay, at least I did something right. So at least, no matter how messy this food is, the rice came out better. And that helps the person's confidence. It helps the person's self-esteem. So please, if you are a feedback giver, practice and put in the sandwich style, which is positive, negative, and positive. Moving forward, if you are given a feedback, you need to describe a concrete situation or example. You don't just say the food is salty, or you don't just say you are not selling the phone. Describe with the situation. Or give an example. Also, explain the effect on you. Now let's talk about, now because this has to do with you working with someone. Say for example, you have a roommate and um, your roommate likes to turn on the lights on when he or she is going to bed. And that is a very, for you, you love when your room is dark. It has a negative effect on you. Explain, let the person know that, okay, I understand that you love to have the light on, which is good because you have your reasons, but having the lights on has a negative effect on me. It interrupts my sleep. At this point, you should pause to listen for unclarities. You should pause to listen if the person has something to say. And if there's nothing, then give concrete suggestion for change. Say, for example, I would recommend if you buy a bedside lamp, if you want the lights on, that's a, that's a concrete suggestion. You're just giving a suggestion. And on the other side, if you are the feedback receiver, when the person is talking, and honestly, we are all work in progress, trust me. Like, this, is, this goes to me, me as well. When the person is talking, you should listen and not interrupt. I know the way our brain just flips when somebody is trying to tell you something. Or we, Most of us don't like feedback, which is normal. We are humans. We just don't like it when someone says we're doing something that is not right. But when, you are, when someone is giving you the feedback, if you want to grow, you should listen. Do not interrupt. Let the person talk. Let the, hear the person out. Where you should talk is when you don't understand. And that should be after the person, probably you, or you'd see the person pausing. And also, it depends on the conversation. If it's getting heated up, you should not even, just let it go. Just, just let the person finish talking. Then you can clarify if you don't understand. And if you are following this webinar, Clarity means active listening. You are trying to clarify what the person is saying. And going back to the light and bedside lamp example, you should clarify by saying, so what you're saying is that um, you don't want the lights on at all, like 100%. So that way you're clarifying to know what exactly the issue is. And after clarifying under normal circumstance, if you want to grow your feedback and communication skills, you should thank the person for recognizing this point of view. Okay, thank you for letting me know that this light I put on is affecting you. A lot of people would just strike up a conflict from that, and which is normal. Like I'm sure I've, I'm, I'm sure I've done this in the past, and I'm sure I've even done this like of recent, trust me. But like I said, we are all work in progress. You should thank the other person and recognize their point of view. Thank you for letting me know this. And you cannot decide how the feedback applies to you. Decision means that, okay, this person has given you the concrete suggestion for change. It's not left for you to decide how that feedback will apply to your life. Okay, do I have to um, try to cope with this person? Do I go get a bedside lamp, for example? It just helps you to decide on what to do. But imagine if this person is giving the feedback and you would not let the person listen. You wouldn't let the person know the effects of this thing, of how... For example, the lights on, you don't know how, you wouldn't let this person talk. One, it leads to a conflict. Two, your listening skills is not, it's just going to be going down the line because you're not helping yourself to be a good listener. And see, it doesn't help the situation. As a matter of fact, like, you just, you, you get at just wasting your time because at the end of the day, you get nothing tangible will be gotten from, this, from the conversation. Moving forward, let's talk about conflict resolution. 
conflict happens honestly like it's just something we can avoid as long as you you working with someone as long as you're living with someone as long as you are not alone in anything you're not in, you're not on an island or whatever conflict will happen so now it's left for you to know how to deal with the conflict the first thing which i would say the most common one is the avoiding a lot of people avoid conflicts which is very fine like i do too because you you are just trying to like whatever i'm just going to let it go i would just ignore the step and and just pretend as if this is not happening but guess what it doesn't help it doesn't work at all because if you avoid a conflict it's more like you're pushing the conflict forward right you just pushing the let's say oh this um going back to the light example if you avoid it saying that okay i'm just going to pretend as if i didn't hear anything and i'll continue to put on the lights guess what it will happen again and by the time it happens it might be worse off so avoiding conflict basically is just it's just you ignoring the step and that doesn't lead to conflict resolution like i said earlier a lot of people avoid conflict because they believe that I would rather avoid and deal with it but it doesn't lead to a win-win situation whereby both parties are happy accommodating is a people pleaser oh my goodness a lot of people are people pleasers in the sense that they would rather hurt themselves than than hurt someone else sometimes it works especially if you're a mother like you rather hurt yourself than hurt your child but when it comes to dealing with people especially in the work environment it doesn't work as a matter of fact if you are a people pleaser it ruins your leadership skills it means that you are not a good leader because if you are a good leader you won't just be pleasing people you will not just be um okay i will let you have it okay go ahead and do it no you should fight for yourself you should be able to talk you should be able to express your concerns as well because when it comes to conflict conflict you want it they want it right and how do you get to the how do you get to a situation whereby everybody will be happy if you are accommodating you are pleasing people one person has it you don't have anything just because you're trying to push it you're trying to you're trying to please the person and i would over 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 emphasize this if you want to grow your leadership skills you cannot be pleasing people every time no you have to be able to get to the point that okay i need to speak for myself i need to be able to get what i want as well and compromising compromising is just partly solving is is a conflict in the sense that one party um is happy and the other one is not really happy compromising is very close to people pleasing but compromising is just saying one person has let's say instead of accommodating which means one person has 100% the other person has zero but compromising is just that maybe one person would have 70 the other person will have 30 which means it doesn't really solve the conflict 100% it's just the way of okay we'll just compromise i say com- compromising a little a, very close to avoiding in the sense that a lot of people compromise just because they're trying to avoid the conflict there are some situations where by compromising would work in the sense that um maybe you're trying to share something with someone at work you just have to compromise and let it go right because if you're fighting for okay i want to i, I want to make sure i have the same thing i want the 100 i want the 100% to be divided into equal halves you might just be a fighter then you just start you like oh the black girl that lost to fight sometimes you just have to compromise and let it go and competing is choosing me is this the opposite of accommodating like if you are the type that okay i don't care how this this whole thing works i need to choose me i need to satisfy my own desires one they say you're selfish two um you they will say you don't know how to you don't have to you don't know how to you're not a good team player you don't know how to work with people so competing like choosing me is just it doesn't work anywhere actually even between your siblings like okay um whatever it is i will choose me it doesn't work because you're just satisfying yourself and 
if you are high in emotional intelligence, which I talked about earlier, if you are empathetic, you will be able to recognize another person's emotions as well. So you should not choose you. You should not choose me. You should be able to work with the person. Say, for example, with the light and um, roommates example, like if you want to choose you, you would say, whatever, I like the lights on and that's it, simple. But that doesn't work. It's just you being selfish because you are one, you are not high in emotional intelligence to recognize other person's emotions and you are not empathetic. You need to be able to listen to people as well, understand their perspective. This person is saying this, I cannot choose myself because you're just satisfying your own desires. And collaborating is the best conflict resolution method, which is the win-win. Collaborating just means that you are finding the middle ground, you're finding the solution that would, that would um, make everybody happy. Say, for example, if you, if you are to share something 100%, win-win means 50-50. A good example will be a situation whereby this person decides to get a bedside lamp, which bedside lamp is still, I can't sleep with the bedside lamp on. It's still a lot of light, but it's just that you need the light on, but if the other person has the best side lamp on and maybe it's on the lower bunk, it's a lot better than having the full light on. Another example of win-win would be maybe you're trying to share something with someone and you pick your strength, the person picks his or strengths, and you're just sharing things based on strength and weaknesses. Two strengths, two weaknesses, whatever, right? So it's just you finding a way of satisfying both sides. To be honest with you, like let's be practical here. Win-win doesn't happen all the time. It's, as a matter of fact, it's very rare because most people will just say, okay, I will just compromise. I will just let it go or I will just avoid it. Most times you only get win-win maybe when you go buy a car or whatever, or you, have, you buy a land whereby they give you something, you give them something, right? They get your money, you get a new car. And maybe they can just give you incentive like, um, winter tires or oil change or whatever. That is only when you buy things that you actually get the, that you might get a win-win. When it comes to actual human conflicts, like there's nothing you're buying. It's to be honest with you, it's very hard. But the essence of this slide is that the best way to deal with conflicts is to aim for the win-win, which is satisfying both sides. And you can only satisfy both sides if you act if you're a good listener, if you understand the concept of um, giving and receiving feedback and also if you are high in emotional intelligence which means you are able to recognize each other's emotions the person and the person giving you the feedback of the light might not say it in a nice way which is fine but you can control yourself by controlling your emotions right if you are high in emotional intelligence and the person giving the feedback to you is not high in emotional intelligence that is not your problem to deal with you can only deal with your own part your own part means that try to Try to listen, try to understand what this person is trying to say, and try to aim at win-win, which is the collaborating conflict resolution. Conflict is very, it's, it's, it's very deep, like it's, and it's very unavoidable. There's not how you want to do it, that you, that you avoid conflict. You, you work with people in school, when you're working, neighbors, even when you go do grocery shopping, a lot of times. But if you have at the back of your mind that, one, you're not pleasing people all the time. You're not avoiding, we are not competing, you're not choosing me. And compromise is partly, it doesn't, it doesn't um, resolve conflict 100%, but collaborating, which is the win-win, resolves conflict 100%. Now let's talk about growth and goal. Like I said earlier, when I graduated, I told myself that, um, I need to do a lot of things. Like I need to grow when it comes to people skills, when it comes to um, communication and, and all those kind of soft skills. I decided to have a growth, personal growth plan. What did I do right? What I did was beginning of the year, I divided my year in quarters, like um, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. Q1, what do I want to achieve? Q2, what do I want to do? Q3, what exactly do I need to be done? And um, Q4, end of the year, what have I accomplished? It's very important to have a personal growth plan. You can't just accept life as it comes. 
like, oh, you jumped at something, I would do it. Some life happens or whatever, or how we say it, oh, life happens. You need a personal growth plan. You need to have a plan on your growth. And you having a plan on your growth leads to your career plan as well. Say, for example, you are in um, data analysis or engineering or whatever, you should know that by Q1, I need to have grown when it comes to um, project management skills. Q2, I should have my PMP certification. Q3, I should have my, um, maybe I should, I should write to my GRE for my MD. You should have a personal growth plan. It really helps your life to be structured. And also it helps your life to be focused because you have a plan, you have a growth plan already. When opportunities come, it really helps you to fix the plan into you, fix the opportunities into your plan. Before I jumped on John Maxwell's audio, actually John Maxwell, one of my favorite person in the world. I love him a lot. Before I jumped on John Maxwell's audio that talked about growth and goal, I used to think they were the same. I used to think if you have a goal, it means you're growing, but no. Goal and growth are really different. Goal means that my goal is to run five kilometers every Saturday for three months. And there's something in business school called SMART goals. It means you're specific, your goal is measurable, it's attainable, S-M-A-R-R is like your realistic T is that is the time bound. That is a goal. Goal, the keyword for goal is goal is time bound. I want to, um, I want to write a journal every day for three months. The key here is the three months, which is the goal. Goal is always time bound. When you set a goal for yourself, if you are setting your goal in such a way that it's a smart goal, which means it's specific, it's measurable, it's attainable, it is realistic and it's time bound, there is no how your goal should fall. There's, your goal should always fall within a time time period which means when you reach that goal this is very normal like the, even like no matter how much you want to say i'm good when it comes to this you would plateau like you would just stay there or you just find yourself coming down if your goal is to read let's say your goal is to read a book for, let's say um 10 pages a day for three months three months is a time bound it is a goal by the time you get to that three months, if you stay there, you will plateau. Meaning that you will just stay there and if you don't do anything, you will just fall. No matter how you want to do, you plateau. On the flip side, growth is continuous. After reading one book, you continue reading the book. What I tell myself is, as long as I'm living, I want to keep growing. That's just it. If I tell myself, I want, it's good to set goals. Like we all have goals, like honestly, you can't even do without goals. But setting a goal and continuing the goal is growth. Setting a goal to read one book a day, sorry, one, 10 pages a day for three months. And after three months, don't stop. Pick another book and continue. Keyword for growth is continuous. You just have to continue growing. And I put 24 hour rule here because should in case, let's say you achieve a goal, which is something great, like we all want to achieve our goals. Rejoice, celebrate, like be happy. But after 24 hours, please reset and go back to the growth process, which is continuous. That's why I put a 24 hour rule here. I understand like, oh yes, you want to celebrate. Your goal is to... Let's say your goal is to graduate with a first class. And because I said goal is time bound, the time bound here is when school is over. That is the first class. Continuous growth is, no matter how I understand, it's very hard to make a first class, but after 24 hours, please reset. What next? That helps you not to be stagnant. That helps you not to be complacent. What next? Okay, now that I have my first class, let me work towards my master's. Let me work towards some certifications. That is growth. It's continuous. You just have to keep growing. And goal is destination focused, meaning um, first class is a destination. 
my bachelor of engineering i want to make sure i get a first class that is de destination focus but growth is journey which means it never ends you just have to keep going like if you get a first class you want to um you want to get a master's degree you want a scholarship you want to write your GRE, you want to write whatever. It is the journey, it doesn't stop. As long as you're living, please keep growing. I know a lot of, we, all of us will say, I cannot come and kill myself. Um, we only live once or whatever. <laughs> Trust me, those things, you, before you know it, you'll be stagnant. Before you know it, those people that you think they made a, whatever, maybe a second class lower or upper, you, if those ones are keep growing and you that you said, oh, I'm not the first class. Ah, this is what I've come to realize. I cannot come and kill myself. I've done my best. I've, um, you only live once. Is life a war or whatever? Those ones that you think they are just there, if they keep on growing, trust me, they will beat you. They will meet you and, and even go further than you are, that you've gone. So trust me, have the 24-hour rule of celebrating. Be happy. Rejoice. You've done a good, good job give yourself a gift for after 24 hours please get back to what to the to the growth plan what next after this and go motivate people oh yeah once you achieve once you achieve a goal it motivates you to get on other goals but growth mature you it makes you to be mature because it changes your mindset like oh wow i did this if you are growth focused you will be able to know that this is a changed life. This is a changed mindset. I'm growing. I'm very mature. Trust me, I'm not going to lie to you. The first time I read a book, when I still read a book from start to finish, it was like I won Grammys. Like I was so excited. I was like, wow, I did this. Like me, on a normal day, I just buy books, put them in my bookshelf, sometimes take a picture of a page and put on Instagram. And people would think you're reading books. That is how I used to read my books. And sometimes I just read like a page or read this, go on Google and read the summary. And that's how, oh, I've read the book. But the very first time I read the book, but the very first time I read the book and I stayed from start to finish, I was so excited. Sorry, I'm just going to go back here. Yeah. Uh-oh, I can't find my screen. Sorry, just give me two seconds. Um, wisdom share. Okay. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So the very first time, like I said, the very first time I read the book and I finished it, I was so excited. Like, wow, I did this. It changed my mindset about reading books. It made me believe that it's very doable. That's growth. Like, it, the goal part is the motivation, but the growth is to continue doing it just because it matured me. And goal challenges people. It's hard, I'm not going to lie, to challenge you. It really challenges you. But for growth, it will change you. It will change the way you see life. It will change your mindset. And adaptability and resilience. Adaptability and resilience. Life would happen. Oh my goodness. Like life would definitely happen. You just have to be able to like, be a rubber band, stretch and bounce back. Like no matter how you want to do it in life, it will happen. Trust me. And how do you build resilience? You have to remain calm. Have a lot of me time. Me time means that have time for yourself. Go do some, must go for massage, go for spa. It's, it's hard when you're sad, but do it because that moment, it makes you happy. And also embrace change. Accept it. It has happened. There's nothing you can do about it. It has happened. It has happened. You just have to embrace it. And also build positive social relationships. Example of this is LinkedIn. LinkedIn really helped me when doing my lowest low. Like, oh my goodness, it really helped me a lot. Because I'm able to know that, okay, I'm not alone. There are people around me building relationship, building friendship or whatever. But the one thing you cannot avoid in life is, is failure, trust me. And failure doesn't mean that, um, um, the way some people say failure is, uh, failure is when you don't pass your jump or whatever. It's failure, yeah, but, Something might be failure to some people. Say, for example, if you 
if you don't meet the deadline, it might be a, it is a failure. Like you failed when it comes to that. But you just have to be able to bounce back. You have to be able to be calm, accept change, and build positive relationship. Work ethic. Okay, this is very key. Like, it's very, very key. And Tyler Perry defined work ethic as developing good work ethic is key. Apply yourself at whatever you do, whether you are a janitor or taking your first summer job, because your work ethic will be reflected in everything you do in life. A lot of people would I see them working in retail and they say, oh, I don't care. It's just a job. But trust me, the work ethic you get from that job, it follows you everywhere. If you are the type that comes to work late because you're working for Walmart, for example, if you get a job at um, IBM, whatever, and that work ethic would follow you. You might be nice. You might be... Yeah, you might adjust for a week, but it will definitely follow you. And work ethic, excellence. Excellence, being busy is not, doesn't mean that you, you would not do a mediocre job. Like, it doesn't mean you will not do average job. A lot of people will say, oh, I, I'm busy. I, I, I did it for two days. I did it for whatever. But it doesn't mean that you would, you would not do a mediocre job. Excellence is just you putting in your best to avoid errors. Like, if you get a project at work, make sure that it's as flawless as possible. You can do it for two hours and it's excellent. And you can do it for four days, it's excellent. But the main point is that make it as flawless as possible. Time management, ONG, we all need this, trust me. Sometimes you give a project and you will say, I've got time, I can do it in two days. By the time you start on the project and you realize in four days. One key thing about time management is that if you want to avoid stress, start early. Even if it's simple, it's something you can do from your sleep, but just start it. It's better for you to have time to polish it, to make it a lot better than doing, it, than doing a mediocre job because you thought it's something you know and you won't be able to manage your time effectively. Meeting etiquette, please and please and please. If you're in a meeting, please make sure you are writing the minutes of the meeting. It doesn't mean that you are, okay, it's not my job to write the meeting. There is a secretary. Jot something down. Make sure you have something jotted down. Make sure you are, you are taking the minutes of the meeting as well. Because it's easier for you to be in a meeting and say, oh, I remember everything they said. Oh, of course I know what they talked about. But you never know when you would actually need the time to go back to the, to the minutes and say, okay, um, I, think I, I, I think I need to go back to, the, to this meeting to see what I wrote down. And if you are the one hosting a meeting, your meeting should have an agenda, please. Like, you cannot be waving, um, let's start with this. No, okay, let's go back to the um, effect of this thing. Oh, let's go back to the time. Please have an agenda. It just makes you to be as organized as possible. Flow chart and process chart. I understand most people on this call are engineers or into science or whatever. Make sure you have a flow chart of, your, of everything you want to do. Even if it is just to um as if i don't know what simple would be but no matter how simple it is there should be a flow chart it just helps you to avoid mistakes it helps you to deliver an excellent job because if you follow a process there's a chance that you will not do a mediocre job there's a chance that your your overall work will be excellent and emails and phone etiquette omg i'm just going to have like a little bit of focus on this if you're writing an email please and please and please there should be a subject you know why? If the person is trying to search for you, it is a subject they will search for most times. So please, your email should have a subject and your email should be straight to the point. When I say straight to the point, if you are trying to email someone regarding the job, don't say, I am this. When it comes to working, I work really hard. When it comes to um, this, I'm very good at this. Straight to the point. Hi, my name is Tyro. I am interested in this. When it comes to some skills, the skills I have are this. Keep it as straight to the point as possible. Very focused and be clear. Also be polite, no matter how frustrated you are. Please be polite to your emails. Don't write emails like, um, even, even if you are the word president or whatever, be polite. Show that you are at least, you, at least you have her emotional intelligence. Be aware of the person's emotion that is written the email. And if you don't get a response, please follow up within 48 hours doesn't mean you follow up the person didn't reply you like in six hours you send another email please don't do that at least 48 hours 
follow up. And when you want to follow up, make sure you copy the original email you sent saying, hi, I am this. I sent an email dated um, on this date, time, and year. I have copied the original email. I would appreciate if you give me a follow-up. Simple. Make sure you do it within 48 hours. And if you are the one that got an email, please reply within 24 to 48 hours. Don't ignore people's emails. It's, it's not good at all. Please don't do that. If you, when you receive an email, make sure you always acknowledge it and make sure you, between 24 to 48 hours, it just shows the person they are not interested in whatever the person is trying to say. It means that, okay, she's not interested. Like, you do not reply somebody's email. Like, okay, whatever. That means that it doesn't bother me. And phone call etiquette. Please, background noise is not acceptable, especially if you, are, if you applied for a job. You've applied for several jobs and there are chances that you'll be receiving some phone calls. If you are, if you are in a place that is a background noise, I would, I would appreciate if you go to the washroom or don't even pick the call. But if I just want to pick in the call, you are on the, you are on the bike and there's a lot of background noise. How on earth do you want the person to feel like, oh, what's this? Especially recruiters are very busy. I'm not going to lie to you. Sometimes you have to go through, like say, 50 resumes and you have time to be calling somebody back. Nope, there's no time. So make sure you don't have background noise and you lower your voice and speak respectfully. Thank you for calling me. I appreciate your call. And by the time the person introduces his or herself, my name is Tayo. If you have good people skills, you should write this person's name down. At the end of the call, thank you Tayo for taking the time to talk to me. Like make sure you make the person feel like, oh, this person actually understands. This person understand what I said. This person was following up. This person was listening. Thank you for taking the time to, to talk with me. I appreciate. Have a good day. Make sure you remember the person's name. When they call you, I'm, my name is this calling from this company. Write the name down immediately. At the end of the conversation, talk and thank them. And also, during interview, during interview, phone interview, if you don't know what the person is trying to ask you, just tell them, Oh, thank you for asking me this. I will take this away. It means that you don't know, but you are willing to know. It just makes the person feel like, okay, I think she's, I think she's willing to learn. And when you pick up your phone call, please don't just say hello. When I was job hunting, I was very professional. Even if it's my mom that's calling me, I say, good afternoon, Taya speaking. Like you just have to be professional. You just have to make the person calling you sound like, oh, I think she, 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 she's professional enough. So let's talk about, um, now that you've, we've talked about all these things, what next? Discover your strength. Please be, try to know yourself. Try to know who you are. Try to know what exactly works for you. Try to know what, you, what are your weaknesses. And John Maxwell said it best, follow your strengths. Whatever your strength is, like after you discover yourself, after knowing yourself, hammer on your strength. My strength is this. I'm just going to give my strength 100%. I'm going to give, my I'm going to give it all to my strength. It doesn't mean you are, it doesn't mean you are um, avoiding your weakness. No. It's just that when you're successful with your, um, with your strength, it's a lot easier to deal with your weakness, right? Because you can tell yourself, you can have the confidence that I've, I have done this. There's a chance that I can do something else right so whatever it is make sure you discover your strength and follow it hold on to your strength and have a personal growth plan enthusiasm and discipline is a lot different you can be very enthusiastic and you're not disciplined honestly it's very possible what what the main difference here is that enthusiasm gets you excited you are happy about the opportunity you are happy to grow but discipline keeps you growing discipline is the growth like it keeps you going. If you are not disciplined enough to, you can set up a goal with enthusiasm. Like you, I'm very excited about this, but discipline will make you grow as a goal because you are going to tell yourself, no matter what, no matter how crappy the day is, I will read for 15 minutes. No matter how crappy the day is, I will make sure I do, I, I, um, I do whatever goal I want to, to do, right? So just make sure you are disciplined. It's the different thing to be enthusiastic. Honestly, it's very different. When you are so excited about something, and enthusiasm doesn't get the job done. It doesn't. Discipline gets the job done. 2190 rule. Oh my goodness. This rule helped me to build a lot of things. Like reading books. It takes 21 days 
for you to be for you to be used to a habit and it takes 90 days for it to become a lifestyle whatever you want to do just look at the calendar 21 days i need to do this and i need to do it every day trust me believe you me you will be able to do it for 90 days if you can do it for 21 days non-stop tell yourself okay 21 days i'll read a book every day it might be half a page it might be one line just tell yourself 21 days i will read a book before you know it 90 days is already a lifestyle and then, and this is the the effect of compound effects if you will drop a tiny um drop of water every day for 90 days no matter how time you will get so you you will be able to see something that you've done so please it's hard for you to start a new life it is very hard to start a new habit but just remember 21 90 21 days to build a habit 21 days i'll do this before you know it's 90 days after 90 days it becomes a lifestyle and deliberate practice please podcast read books soft skill courses there are a lot of them on linkedin learning if you don't have LinkedIn Learning, they are YouTube. They are, John Maxwell has a YouTube channel you can subscribe to. It's very useful. There are lots of courses. There are a lot of resources to help you grow your soft skills. What helped me most is reading books and podcasts. Like I told myself, I would read a lot of books. The first book I read, like I, like I said, it was a struggle, but I did it. Afterwards, it's so easier for me to keep reading books. Choose your learning style. Some people, some people like to do things in the morning when they wake up. That doesn't work for me. I love to do these things at night. Some people love to do things at night. Make sure you choose your learning style. Know what works best for you. And be, be growth conscious. Your mindset has to change. Even if you have a PhD, even if you have yeah, a professor emeritus, when opportunity comes your way, listen to decide if it's not your, if it's not your, um, your calling or not. Please and please and please. Coach Wooden says something. I think I wrote that post down somewhere. It says, it is what you learn after you know that counts. That's from Coach Wooden, John Wooden. It is whatever you learn that after you know it all that counts. I know we like to say, oh, I know what she's talking about. I know what it's going to say. I know, I know, I know. Yes, but what if you do not know? Listen, change your mindset. Always welcome change. And also, avoid a fixed mindset. Avoid a fixed mindset means that... Um, I'm just going to focus on this and nothing else. No, always welcome change. Always welcome things. Like, don't have a fixed mindset about life. Like I said earlier, if you, it's what you know after you, it's what you learn after you know that counts. Um, I'm an engineer and that's it. What is the person to help you with your communication skills? What is the person to help you with your public speaking skills? We are, we are saying your mindset is fixed on engineering alone. You're not, you're not focusing on something else. So please, make sure you discover your strength. Make sure you have a personal growth plan. 2192 rule is very key. Deliberate practice, like keyword here is deliberate. You have to be conscious about it. Read books, podcasts, soft skills. Choose your learning style. It's very important. Mindset change and avoid fixed mindset. Please, always welcome change. Always welcome growth. You can be, um, you can know it all. Trust me, when somebody is trying to talk to you about something, take time to listen. Remember we talked about active listening. Listen, clarify, ask questions. And to wrap up, this is one of my favorite quotes, which says, hard work beats talent when talent fails to work hard. If you don't work hard about something, no matter how talented you are, someone that is putting in the work will beat you. Trust me. No matter how much you want to say, oh, I'm the best engineer, I have a 4.0 GPA, I have whatever. Someone that is working hard on so many skills will beat you and will have a better job and career success than you do. John Maxwell always says something, leaders are made a born. You can, have, you can be born with some leadership skills. Like when it comes to, maybe you're the most first born have leadership skills, I'm not going to lie, because they are used to um, delegating tasks at a very young age. But if they don't, upgrade themselves there's not how they can grow and stagnation makes you plateau if you are grow if you are goal conscious like all you have to do is i need to set a goal you plateau and you stagnant and stagnant stagnation and complacency it doesn't help you grow there's not how you can achieve growth or success when you're stagnant and you're complacent also happiness is growth it makes you look happy it builds your confidence excuse me knowing that this is me i'm growing 
I like the woman I'm becoming. Um, looking back, this is what I've achieved. This is what I've learned. This is, this is what has changed. It makes you so much happy. So that is the end of today's webinar. I hope you are able to take away some things and I hope you're, you understand that now that soft skills are very important when it comes to your long-term success. And also always remember that 75% of your, of your long-term success, which is whatever um, dream you have in your career, it depends on your soft skills. And I hope you also remember that happiness is growth. So please grow in. Please keep growing, like continuously. Don't stop. Thank you. And that's my email address. Should in case you have any um, any inquiries or whatever, please don't hesitate to shoot me an email.